If you would, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Matthew 13. Last week, we looked at what a parable is and why Jesus spoke in parables, and we'd like to uh, go into the first parable following that. And I've entitled this, Who's in the Kingdom? Uh, because I think that's what it's really talking about here. Um, by the way, uh, last week we saw that Jesus um, gave the parable and then later explained the parable. So that's how we'll read this. We'll read verses 3 through 8 and then we'll pick up in uh, verse um, nine, uh, 18 and read through 23. So first the parable and then the explanation of the parable. This is the sower of the seed, or I'm sorry, sower, parable of the sower, but many call it the uh, parable of the four soils. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell uh, and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Now we'll skip down to verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what is sown. When we first started our ministry in upstate New York, there was a man named Stuart Rankin and his wife, and they helped us get started. In fact, he had retired from his church uh, after many years of service in Silver Spring, Maryland, and was asked to interim in the church that we eventually became pastor and wife of. And um, we became good friends. And he would once in a while then visit the church after we were there. I remember having presbytery and so forth. So we would see each other quite often. And on one visit, he told me the story about a girl who was raised in his church, a very sharp girl. Uh, she knew uh, what the gospel was. She could articulate it clearly. She claimed to have received Christ as Lord and Savior. I think they had some kind of confirmation class. She knew her theology. She really knew her stuff. She was um, baptized and bore testimony before the church. And then she left everything and just said bye-bye. He said, that was a shocker. Uh, and yet, as I have lived, I realized that it is a very common story. And it's not just young people who grow up Christian and leave. Adults leave also. See it often. Uh, they may still profess or have Christ somewhere back in a corner of their mind, but their lives say something else. I remember when I first, this first happened to me, not that I fell away, but someone who I thought was solidly there then took a hike. And why did it trouble me? And why couldn't I figure it out? Because at the time, and I still believe this, by the way, I've preached it, that once saved, always saved. And then how do you have that and a person then leaving Christ? You know, but back then, to me, everyone who said the sinner's prayer was saved. So how could they get unsaved? You know, we, we treat the sinner's prayer like it's magic, you know. Say a prayer and presto change, oh, you're saved. Now, as I said, I believe in the sinner's prayer because many hearts are open to Jesus, as we just heard testified by Stacy uh, in the sinner's prayer. 
But now I would say, you know what? Once saved, always saved, if indeed you're saved. If indeed you're saved. Um, according to Jesus and the apostles, salvation is not a momentary thing, as Jesus makes clear, short-lived or spurious. Salvation is not necessarily determined by saying yes to Jesus. It's the heart that receives the word that makes all the difference. And so as you see, entering Christ through the sinner's prayer is one thing, but those who truly enter persevere and continue on in the faith. The heart of the person who receives the gospel is what really matters. Is the heart of the person truly open and prepared by the Holy Spirit, or did the person only experience some short-lived thing? So the heart is the heart of the matter. There's one sower who is God or Jesus Christ. There's one gospel message, but that message falls on various hearts. And who receives them and who doesn't, you know, uh, is what Jesus is talking about here. He gives us four responses to the gospel. Um, and the last one, if you'll notice, is the only one that hangs in there. The first three do not. Okay? So um, uh, another way of saying this is there are four hearts. And I borrowed my outline from Jim Boyce, at least the wording of it, um, or James Montgomery Boyce. Uh, he talks about the four hearts, and I just liked his outline, so here it is. But my thesis is this. Those who truly believe stay with the Lord and mature, and those who don't, don't. Some may think that soil number three might be saved along with number four, and I won't even argue. I won't argue, okay? My thesis will be that only number four is truly the one who is saved. Remember that Jesus is speaking to people in parables for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons is to separate those who truly believe and want to know the truth and those who don't. That's why you have this break. He gives the parable, and then later he explains it to a group that really wants to know the difference. Each of these soils is in the crowd that he was addressing that day. And uh, I go back to the, uh, uh, the parable. Uh, there's one big idea. So I take soil number four to be the real Christian. The others are not. But the first heart, uh, James Boyce calls the hardened heart. So if you walk, uh, were to walk onto a field then or a big open area, there would be separate fields owned by people, but there wouldn't be really the distinction there. They wouldn't be as defined as they are now. This area would be open, and there may have been like paths going between these fields of the various owners. And the paths would then be packed down. And when the sower came along, sowed his seed, he was indiscriminate, and some of the seed just went on, on the pathway there. Um, seed was sown with no worry of its falling on infertile soil. So the sowing of seed was not defined like it is today. The seed that lands on the hardened soil doesn't even have a chance to take root. And so the birds get a free meal. And worse, as he interprets the uh, parable, the devil gets in there and persuades the person to reject the message. It's hard for me to comprehend, it just is, um, that people can continue, once they know about Christ, to reject him. You know, part of it is, I know, I have believed so long, I'm so entrenched in my faith and so forth that it is hard to comprehend. But even when I first heard the gospel, I was in conflict. I wasn't totally hardened, you know. Uh, um, I remember saying to myself, you know, here it is Sunday morning, you're all strung out from the night before, and I'm listening to Phil Wisenhunt preach and explain the gospel and the consequences that if you don't, you know where you're going. And I remember saying to myself, boy, I've never heard this before. You see, I just grew up in a nominal church where I never understood the gospel and that there needed to be a response to the gospel and so forth. And so I said, boy, I have never heard this before. And 
am I going to have to give in? I remember saying to myself, um, or at least or, or as I was listening, you know, half of me would say, look, the consequences are too great. They are eternal. You're going to have to do something. I'm speaking to myself. The other half of me would say, not yet. You're having too much fun. <laughs> right. Right. You're having too much fun. But there was not a total hardness. God was getting through, and thank God he did. But others persist in their hardness. Um, you know, for some reason, maybe it's intellectual uh, for them. You know, to believe just simply makes no sense. But there are good reasons to believe. In fact, I am to the point that the only thing that makes sense is believing in God and Jesus Christ. Um, and by the way, there's nothing purely academic. You know, there's a, there's a heart issue as well there. But some don't even think about it. You know, they hear the gospel. They don't even think about it. Uh, some have become old, and they have health issues. And they know what's coming, the inevitable. But they seem still to have no need. Paul calls it the heart of stone that has to be turned into the heart of a flesh. He talks about the God of this world blinding their eyes and God alone can take the blinders off so that they can see. So what can you and I do about those who have heard and yet remain hardened? The only thing we can do is pray. That's the only thing we can do. As Stacy said, salvation is a miracle and God changed her heart. God has to do the work. That's the first heart, hard. Uh, the second one is a shallow heart. And I don't know which is worse. You know, the, this soil um, or the first. Alice has told me several times, you know, in a small town, she grew up right across the street from the church. And I told you the way she rebelled was she went to church because her parents didn't. Uh, and she said, at least my parents were consistent. They didn't give me a mixed message. They didn't believe and therefore they didn't go to church. They didn't act a certain way on Sunday and then a different way through the week. They were entirely consistent. So I don't know what's worse, you know, the first soil or the second. Um, but as we look out onto our fields, you know, we might see a high spot or a knoll and the, the soil there is kind of sandy and gravelly and it doesn't hold the moisture as well. And that's my, maybe what you have in mind. But I think what we have here in biblical times and in that part of the world is just soil that's really close to the bedrock or the bedrock is just underneath the soil. And so you have a very shallow layer of, uh, of soil and seed falls upon that too. Um, and it actually does take root, um, but it easily becomes parched, and it's dead, and there's nothing left. There's no life, so forth. Um, people like this hear the gospel, make even, perhaps, a profession, but disappointment uh, turns them away. He talks about the hardships of life. So disappointment comes into their life, and they turn away. Their faith is spurious. It's short-lived. Um, they may be people who are a part of a church. You know, they kind of fit in with the teaching. Uh, they even make a decision. Maybe some of them are baptized. But hardship causes them to say at some point, this isn't working. Sayonara. And who is this God anyway who would bring suffering into my life? Are there people who look to Jesus to fix their troubles? Yeah. And I've known a number of them, you know, as they bore testimony. You know, I came to Jesus because I was troubled. There was things in my life and so forth. And I wanted Jesus to come into my life and fix my problems. And when Jesus no longer fills the void the way they thought he would... And when he doesn't remove their sufferings, or when he does not fix what they think needs fixing, they leave. You know, make no mistake, Jesus is the answer to the wounded heart. And his presence gives us inner peace 
and rest, and he gives people hope, meaning, and purpose, and so forth. But he's not a fixer. He's not a fixer. Jesus is a savior from sin and alienation from God. He gives us salvation. He gives us a relationship with God that is eternal. But he is not with us to keep us from hardship. In fact, instead, he leads us right into hardship. For hardship is what makes us grow. And Jesus knows our sufferings. We have a God who understands pain because Jesus Christ suffered much. God himself knows pain. And we are promised that God in Christ will walk through with us through all our times of trouble. But those of the second soil seem to misinterpret hardship. That the thing that is there to make them grow is scorned and they bail or they jump ship. They say, this isn't working and I'm out of here. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is not a fixer. He's a savior. Then thirdly, there's the strangled heart. If you've not been blessed with much money, maybe you should be glad because it's hard to manage money in a godly fashion. Um, Jesus talks more about money and the managing of it than he does talk about uh, sex and other sins. It's just a difficult thing when it comes into our lives. And it can take over ever so gradually um, uh, than we think. Than we think. So we need to be on our guard, always. You know, some wonder if this person is a Christian who has let the desires of life choke out the pursuit of God. And that most certainly does happen uh, to Christians. You know, I, I've seen this scenario many, many times. Uh, you know, boy meets girl at Bible camp. Parents have always said, now, when you marry, make sure to marry a Christian. I would say, when you marry, marry a Christian who's got it together also, at least has his or her priorities right. They date, they marry, and they have kids together. Um, and they've done what they're told, at least all they know. But as a couple, the question is, have they really sorted out their priorities? Because they're soon to get swept into life. So they finally land the job. You know, the promotions come, or at least the raises. And before they know it, God isn't really first. And the thing is, Christians become so numb, they don't even know it's happened. We may even think that we're more spiritual than we really are, because it is so gradual. Uh, but God can get back Bernard. Um, it could be a Christian, you know, who's just slipped away. But it also may be a sign that this person is not a Christian at all and wasn't even to begin with. Je Jesus made it clear that a person can't serve God and mammon at the same time. One or the other. We're to take our pick. That's Matthew 6. He also made it clear that a person without fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, may not be saved. Not everyone, he says, who... Um, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, Matthew 7. Is it okay to check ourselves once in a while, <laughs> make sure we're saved? Perfectly fine. I love to hear the stories of young children who grew up in the church. I must have accepted Jesus 20 times in my life. That's fine. That's just fine because they're concerned. And they want to be sure. I've done it myself. I've done it myself. I knew what I was preaching this morning. I sat down in the office and said, let's just make sure, God. Okay? I say that maybe in a funny way, but you know what? Time to time, you get away from the Lord, and it doesn't hurt to check. I've used this illustration before. And last week I said if you use illustrations too much, they might just fall flat. But I'm going to use it again. But it's from the Chronicles of Narnia. By the way, when I opened my book, it just completely disintegrated and fell apart. So I only have two, two pages here. And I'm thinking, boy, if I ever get the privilege of reading to my grandchildren, um, I'll have to get a new book. But it's the last book in the Narnia series, 
the last battle, and it's about Susan, a queen of Narnia, who doesn't show up in the end to Aslan's land. And so, as Lewis tells the story, Sir, said Tyrion, when he had greeted all these, if I have read the Chronicles aright, there should be another. Has not your majesty two sisters? Where's Queen Susan? My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. Um, yes, said Eustace, and whenever you've tried to get her to come and talk about Narnia or do anything about Narnia, she says, what wonderful memories you have. Fancy you're still thinking about all those funny games we used to play when we were children. Oh, Susan, said Jill. She's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She always was a jolly sight, too keen on being grown up. She doesn't end up in Aslan's land. Now you can say, but didn't Lewis say elsewhere in the Chronicles, once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. By the way, I believe that. Yeah, I guess if you were a true king to begin with. We just don't know. But even if she was, there is a mystery here that we can't fully explain. And I just accept the mystery. There is a mystery that we can't explain and we just have to accept that some who have made a response to Jesus, leave them. Just leave them. Um, the life Susan shared with the others in Narnia was strangled out by things. Narnia was this vague memory of the children making believe and playing games. The present things of life captured her heart and her focus so much that she could not see correctly. So maybe Susan proved herself to be someone else versus a true king in Narnia. And that's the way it is with many. They get so far away from the Lord, they don't even know where they're at. One friend of mine, an uh, elderly man, has two children. One responded to the gospel and went on for him. One maybe made some kind of spurious thing, but has never lived with God. And I asked him about her, and she said, he said, Larry, she's a stranger to grace. <laughs> she's a stranger to grace. Breaks his heart. People's lives prove who they really belong to. Then there's this last soil, the open heart. The final soil is rich, and it has a wonderful yield. It hears the gospel. It gets the gospel, not just for a moment, but for a lifetime, and goes on for the Lord. And so I want to give three assurances for salvation. The first, and we can ask ourselves three questions. One is, do I believe in the finished work of Christ and have I responded to that and received it for myself? Do I believe? By the way, Matthew 3, verse 16. Uh, for whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. But it's in the present tense. And it's one of those things called a participle. It's got an ing on the back of the, uh, at the end of the word. For whosoever is believing... For whosoever believes. So to recite the sinner's prayer and to receive Christ is our entry, if you will, into a life of continual belief. Do I believe in the finished work of Christ and have I received it for myself? Second, is there the witness of the Holy Spirit, as Romans 8 talks about, which assures us that we are indeed his? And the final one is there fruit? Is there evidence? Is there a yield, you know? And it doesn't matter whether it's 160 or 30. He's not saying the Christian life is a contest, you know, that we're trying to outdo one another. People get saved at different times. And he's just saying, is there fruit? One way or another. I like, if you read this uh, parable in Mark and Luke, Luke says he adds the word perseverance in this last um, soil. So those who are truly saved persevere. And those who aren't, don't. Being a Christian is more than an event, you know, where we pray to prayer and please 
Don't misunderstand me. I believe in the sinner's prayer. And I do believe that it is often entrance into the kingdom of God. But for some, it's just that. Um, Being a Christian is more than a sprint. Being a Christian is a marathon. And every day I pray for Alice. I pray for myself. I pray for the kids because they've got this long life, God willing, ahead of them. And now I'm seeing grandchildren, and I pray for them. I say, oh, God, please, just keep them and hold them firmly to yourself. Now let me read to you something from James Montgomery Boyce. He's talking about some other points, so that's how the sentence starts here. But he says, but these points are less important than the main one, namely that it is only the open heart that receives the preaching of the gospel and is saved, not the hard heart, Not the shallow heart, not the uh, strangled heart. The only heart that ever receives the truth of the gospel is saved. I'm sorry, yeah. That ever receives the truth of the gospel and is saved is the heart that opens itself to Jesus and his teaching. So the most important question is, yeah, what kind of heart do I have, you know? Many years ago, in fact, it's the first year that we took the high school kids out to Wyoming. And uh, I was not doing the devotional that night, but uh, somehow we got on the subject of, you know, kind of figuring out where you might be because some of those kids were far, far and away. And one of the kids came up to me, and he talked to me, and I ex- kind of explained this whole thing to, to him, as I, I said this morning. And he said, well, now you're scaring me. <laughs> I didn't say it out loud, <laughs> but I said it in my head. Good. Good. Because there's very little, if any, evidence in your life that you know Jesus as your Savior. And a good scare hasn't hurt anybody that's that far away. By the way, I have yet to see him really return. So, um, what was his problem? He could say, well, back there, I think I did it. Well, yeah, you did it. What did you do? You know, what's been happening since? (laughs) You know, nothing. Now you're scaring me. Good. Some people need a good scare. Now, do I believe in a decision for Christ? As I said repeatedly, yes. Let's just make sure it's real. Something emotional and short-lived isn't the real thing. So you may be here, and you've yet to respond to Christ and really open your heart and say, I believe. You say, well, what do I do to become a member of the kingdom? Well, very simply, you look at the finished work of Christ, you say, I believe that. And then we open our heart and we receive it for ourselves. We receive Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, even though sometimes it's kind of difficult. It's rich and powerful. And so I pray that you use it in our lives this day. Amen.